Our scripture today is from the Gospel of Matthew. We're going to be reading from the fourth chapter, verses 12 through 23. So hear this word. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea, across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As he walked by the sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in a boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately, they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. This is the word of God for all of us, the people of God. Thanks to you, God. I've got a grill in my garage, and for the last two years, I have been looking at this grill, like every time I get in the car, I look at it, because it takes up so much space, and I think, what am I going to do with you? Uh, this is a wedding gift, and it's really hard to do away a wedding gift. Uh, but this is a wedding gift, and when we first had this grill, I used to love cooking on it. I used to love cooking hamburgers, broths, I used to love, I love cooking broths in the grill. But then a couple years ago, I quit eating meat. Now let me tell you, you just, you just can't grill a into meat, okay? Uh, I, I thought about, you know, some people suggest, like, I could thought of maybe cutting a zucchini long ways, some olive oil, some salt and pepper, and putting that in the grill. Uh, that would be pretty good, I guess. Uh, I thought about maybe doing like a portobello mushroom, and then turning that into a burger, like a portobello mushroom burger. Some of you look like you're about to get. Um, so anyway, after, after the first summer, I said, you know, you should do a cauliflower burger. You slice a cauliflower, turn it into a burger. I said, I can't, I can't even do that. Uh, but, you know, is, is you know, grilling vegetables really worth, you know, the grill, the space, and the charcoal, and the lighter? Like, am I going to take it out and do all the whole thing just for, you know, grilled zucchini? Like, am I going to do that? Yeah, I don't know. So every day, I go by, and I look at it, and think, what am I going to do with you? This is just sitting there, taking up space. How do you use it? In years. And so there it is. Uh, this past year, I had so many, uh, for those of you who, are, who work on from laptops, I have so many, on, like, just 20 different tabs open on my computer, just like all on the bottom, like unfinished devotionals and sermons that were unfinished and all these ideas that I had just never completed and all there at the bottom. And so every time I turned on my computer, my anxiety would go up because I had all this unfinished work. And at the beginning of the year, I finally said, no, I gotta either close it out, save it, or just get rid of it. And just to kind of clear the space, to clear my head, to, you know, make sure my anxiety was lower. Um, this passage, here at the end, especially, is about the letting go of things. Uh, you may have missed it because it happened so quickly. I mean, it happened in like two verses, but Christ called out to the disciples and said, Hey, uh, I'm calling you to follow me. Come on, let's go. And they, there's no van there. There's no debate. There's no, like, they, they, James and John ever said, to them, Should we make a to-do list? Christ said, follow me. He didn't mean follow him for a day or for a week. He meant follow me for the rest of your life. And so what they did, James and John and, and Peter and Simon and Peter and Andrew later, is when Christ called them, they just dropped their nets. And they left. The nets were literal, but it's also metaphorical. The nets was their trade. The nets is how they made their living. It was the thing they trained for. It was the family business. I mean, the scripture says that he left his father. He was leaving the family. He was dropping his career in a moment, just in a moment, happens so quickly. It makes me think that maybe, you know, for years before, maybe God was stirring up something in our hearts. Maybe there was something unsatisfied 
Maybe they knew they were called to more and they just couldn't figure out what, what it was. Maybe they knew that God was pu pushing them to do something else, but they just didn't know what it was. And they were just waiting around for that opportunity to come walking down the beach. And then when Christ said, come follow me, they knew this is it. This is the thing that we've been waiting for our whole lives. This is that moment. I wonder if anyone here has something stirring inside of them that you've known for a while, that there's something, some new direction you're supposed to go and that there's something new you're supposed to add to your life and you just can't quite put your finger on it. And you're just sort of waiting, just sort of waiting for that moment. But Christ, when you call someone, he, he's actually very stark about it. He's, you know, there's this one guy, he went to him and he said, uh, Jesus, I want to follow you, I'm ready to do this. And Jesus said, okay, great, sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Seems pretty extreme, but the reason why he said that is because that was the thing, that was his net. That was the thing that was entangling him, that was holding him back. He said, if you can't let that go, then money, you don't have to be able to follow you. There's this one guy who said, I, I want to follow you, but hold on, my father just passed. Let me bury him real quick. Just give me a couple days to do that. And Jesus said, no, 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 no. But the dead bury the dead. That's, that's pretty harsh. There's another instance where a guy wanted to follow Christ, and he, he didn't want to leave his family, though. And, and Christ said, no, you've got to leave your father and your mother, and when you follow me, it might create contention in your own family. Are you ready for that? So every time Christ calls someone, he bids you to let go, to let go of something in your life. You know, nets, by their very nature, are things that entangle. <laughs> they entangle. Are they entangling you? Maybe the net served a good purpose in your life once before. Maybe, maybe it was your trade. Maybe it was your living. Maybe it served a great purpose, but maybe now it's time to let it go. Um, the, the Christian ethicist, uh, Stanley Harlow, probably one of the great ethicists of our last century, uh, he was talking about our modern society. He was critiquing it, and here's what he said. He said that we are becoming a quivering mass of availability. A quivering mass of availability. What he means by that is you know, technology has sort of made it possible for us to be available to everyone 24-7. Jobs, uh, many of you work still, and, and many of your jobs, they expect you to be on call 24-7. You, you get a text, you get a Facebook message. People will get offended if you don't answer that right away. You're always on. You're never off. You're always available. You're always plugged in. And he goes on to say, and we, many of us know this already, that when you're always available, you're never available. So maybe the net you need to let go is just all the busyness you have. Maybe you need to unplug. Maybe you need to let go and have more time for whatever. Now, this is why I take a Sabbath every Monday. It's not because I'm tired of you or anything like that. It's because I need time for my soul to rest. Uh, if I'm always available, then I'm never available. Um, many of you have learned as well that you can't pour anything out of an empty cup. You ever heard that expression? You can't pour anything out of an empty cup. And so maybe letting go of some time can be a way for you of refilling your cup. But then you say, oh, past plus. But you don't understand. I'm like really good at multitasking. I can, oh, I can juggle three over balls at once. Like, I can do that. Well, that's good. But the last two words of that statement should be for now. For now. Because eventually all of us will have an empty cup if we don't take care of the cup that we have. There is this uh, Greek philosopher called this uh, Dysogenes, excuse me. Uh, he was uh, this early Greek thinker who believed, and he had a lot of, he was the founder of this thing called cynicism. And it sounds really negative, but what it really was was this idea that uh, fame and power and money are not the secrets of happiness. All of those things really, you know, lead to being unhappy, he said. Uh, he said that, you know, being virtuous and being honest, those are the things that lead to happiness. And so here's what he did. He simplified his entire life. He just stripped his life down of everything, and he ended up living in a wine vat in Greece. Now, some of you are like, well, not that. That's my retirement plan. That's what I want to do is live in a wine vat in Greece. Uh, but he did that. And when he did, he began writing. He began philosophizing about how we need to separate ourselves from all the entanglements of the world. And you see a streak of cynicism running through the gospel. Every time Christ spoke to a Pharisee or any religious leader, anyone of authority, it is, he was exasperated. He was like, oh, I've seen enough of this. I know how this plays out. You are, you are entangled to the old ways. You think the law will save you. You think strict rules will save you. But I'm telling you, the new way is coming. The new way is here. And I'm trying to free you from all of that. The Apostle Paul, very similar message. In fact, he was very frustrated at points 
because he was trying to bring in the Gentiles, that is all of us, into the faith. And he, was, he said, you know, Christ freed us, and so we're free from the law. And he, he used some very stark, very angry language sometimes to describe this frustration. Uh, there is this one part, you know, Paul, he was not very tactful. In fact, there's, there's one part, there was this guy who was about to have a procedure, was, this, uh, this room, and uh, it reminds me of this commercial out there that's on TV right now. <laughs> Cracks me up every time. It's an AT&T commercial. Maybe you've seen it. The tagline is, just okay is not okay. I mean, yeah, it's so funny. Okay, so there's one, there's one commercial. That this guy's in a hospital room, and he's, he's about to have surgery. He's laying on a hospital bed. It cracks me up because I've been on a lot of hospital beds. And especially here, like, all the surgeons have this impeccable bed manners. And, but uh, he asked the nurse, he's like, hey, have you heard about my surgeon before? And she goes, yeah, he's all right. <laughs> he's okay. And then the surgeon walks in, and the surgeon says, uh, you nervous? He goes, yeah. The surgeon says, me too. And then he shrugs his shoulders and says, we'll figure it out. <laughs> and he walks out of the room. It's funny. So that's terrible bad man. There's Paul. He's so frustrated with these people. They're about to be circumcised. These Gentiles, uh, they believe that they had to become Jewish before they could be a Christian. And Paul said, no, 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 no. I freed you from, Christ freed you from all of this. And I'm telling you, you don't know how to do this. And he became so, if there was one verse Paul could take back, it would be this one. He said, I hope the knife slips during the procedure. Oh, Paul, oh, Paul, oh, no. why would you say that? But he understood what Christ was saying to the people on the beach that day. You can't be a fisherman and a fisher of men. You ever notice what a bad pun that was? Just a terrible pun. A fisher of men. I'm sure you've heard that phrase, fisher of men. They turn their lives around, a bad pun. It would be like uh, Christ going to a courtroom, looking at a lawyer and saying, put down your briefcase uh, because now you're going to defend God. Or he goes into a restaurant and he goes into a kitchen and says, put down your big puffy hat, chef, because now you're going to cook up some good news. And you're going to serve it on quiet power of the Holy Spirit and you're going to put some Jesus sauce on it. Mean, it's a bad pun. It was terrible. Like, I'm sure there was someone on the beach that day who was like, wow, is that really? Did you just say that? No, yeah, it's not really, not really very fun. But they dropped their whole lives. They dropped everything, their career, their, they dropped it all for this guy on the beach with the pun. <laughs> and so I implore you today to think about the things that you need to let go of. And if after today's sermon you say to yourself, you know what, it is time to clean out that garage. Maybe they get rid of that grill or that room with all the clutter and the, the closet that's, you know, just really clutter. Maybe I, maybe I can do that. But, uh, yeah, maybe so. But I think God was calling you to let go a little more than that. Uh, Paul, in one of his writings, he has a long list of sins that people need to let go of. And, and there are a few in particular that I think really pertain to our predominantly middle class monkey junction area here. And one of them is this. One of them is envy. <laughs> Ever feel like you can't celebrate the good fortune of someone else because everyone in your mind is a rival? <laughs> you ever feel like you can't scroll through Facebook because you just you can't handle uh, seeing the success of other people? You ever feel like you can't talk to friends and be happy for them when something good happens to them over a cup of coffee? You just go, oh, yeah, it's good for you, it's good, it's good. You just are filled with envy all the time. Everything's a competition. Paul says impurity. Maybe you like go impurity. And, and Eugene Peterson had a different take on this. What he said was, it's not impurity the way that we think about it. It's impurity, he says, is really an accumulation of mental and emotional garbage. Mental and emotional garbage. Do you ever feel like drama is constantly building up in your mind? As soon as you let go of one drama, there's another piece of drama that comes in. And when they're in this age of so much information, we're just constantly filling our minds and hearts with so much mental emotional garbage. Paul says debauchery. It's probably not debauchery in the way that you traditionally think of it. Uh, Eugene Peterson again says that debauchery might, it is what he calls a frenzied and joyless grab for happiness. So you, you get home from work, you're so dissatisfied with your life, you're so angry about your circumstances, you don't see all the blessings that God is giving you, and you just feel like, all right, what, what show can I binge on Netflix? Like, how can I escape my life? Like, just pass me the rosé, pass me the beer, like, I just want to get out of my life just for a little while. Uh, it's just a frenzy ground for whatever can make you happy. That is debauchery, according to Eugene Peterson. And what about idolatry? Maybe you're not at home making a golden calf, but there are so many things that we prioritize over things that are more worthwhile. Uh, you know, I'm going to think of my generation for a moment. My generation is doing something pretty good. Uh, we're, we're prioritizing experiences over 
stuff. And so we're downsizing, uh, we're living we're in, in, in just easier, less of, more effective ways, and we're trying to uh, prioritize people and relationships and experiences, but I don't know, you can take that too far too. Ever, ever heard of sorcery? Anyone here a sorcerer or sorceress? Uh, no, because this is a Harry Potter world. Um, a sorcery is basically an experiential religion. It's an experiential religion. In other words, it's a religion where you prioritize and worship the experience of things, whatever it is. And so when, when you don't have any money to be charitable or to give to charities or church or whatever, but you can go on three day vacations a year, maybe you're worshiping experiences. Uh, when you prioritize Facebook photos and, and, and trying to have that cool event over here because you think that's what people want to see in the world, uh, then maybe you're worshiping experiences. That can be an idol as well. Again, I say nets by their very nature are things that entangle you. They hold you up. They keep you captive. And so when Peter and us, uh, Andrew and James and John, who are called the sons of thunder, by the way, which is so cool. Feel free to call me the pastor of thunder. <laughs> um, but when these four men dropped their nets, they were dropping all of their entanglements, all of the things that were holding them back. And so I wonder, do you have anything that's holding you back? Is there anything I just listed holding you back? Or maybe there's some other thing that's just holding you back that you don't even really want to think about because you're afraid of letting it go. And so here's my challenge for you this week. Quit something. Maybe not your job. Don't quit your job. <laughs> Don't quit your job and blame it on me. But quit something. Let go of something. Throw away something that's holding you back. Try a different habit. Or change a habit. Or let go of a habit. Let go of something that might be keeping you from experiencing some new thing that God has called you to. Because we are not called to stay in the same old ways forever. The law was good for a time, but then Jesus came and said, you're free from that now. Maybe a a certain job was good for you for, for a time, but now God has freed you from that and he's calling you to something even greater. Or maybe you just got too much mental and emotional garbage and you need to let that go. Quit something this week. That's my challenge. Let us pray. Where we are guilty at times of holding on to things that are no longer valuable. We're guilty at times for not being willing to change for getting too comfortable in the old ways of living, and not being able to trust that you have a new way prepared and that you will take care of us. And so Lord, help us to be a people who trust you and who believe that if we are ready to let go of our nets, you will call us to something greater. We pray these things in your name. Amen.